Today on the Ask Brady Show, we talk about the best way to find the best name for your church. Ask Brady Show episode number 59. We've got four great questions from the people of Pro Church Nation, and I'm joined as always to my left, your right, it's Roxanne. It's true. True it is behind the camera, the editing wizard himself, Joe Dex. And the man with the cam, Alex Mills. Thanks. It's not really as special as it sounds because I work here, but I'm here. Roxanne, take us away, please. Why don't you, if you would, with the first question. All right, the first question comes from Josiah, and he sent in a video. Hey, Brady and Roxanne, this is Josiah coming from Tinnell, Georgia. I've been a longtime follower of yours since the days when you were only blogging, and your dedication to quality church media has been a huge influence on our team's work, so thank you. My question for you is in regards to Facebook groups. We've been posting daily to our social media account for about two years now, and we have a pretty good idea of what our community will respond to, but we're about to start a Facebook group for our church, and I'm curious how you set up a safe space for the church members to initiate the conversation. Do you have any tips on getting people to join once you've started the group, and what would you recommend as guidelines for limiting things like soliciting from people who own businesses within our church? Should the group be private or public? Basically, how do we get from the start of our group to the target that you've pointed out in previous episodes. I look forward to your answers and thank you for the quality info you guys put out each day. Thank you for the question, Josiah. Appreciate you being with us. OG, day one. Love yes. that. Uh, let's work through, I think there's like three phases to answering this question. And the first phase is, how do you get people into the Facebook group? And I always like when it comes to, when, it, when you have to move people from like one group to another, anytime you have to work through a logistic like this, I always like to incentivize. So for instance, one of the most valuable things that we can capture as Pro Church Tools is someone's email address. And that's a logistic where, you know, it's not hard or difficult for someone to give you their email, but it's more of just an inconvenience. And so mm -hmm. to make it happen, you have to incentivize it. So I would run a contest for a week two, maybe for a whole month within your church where the way to win the contest is you have to be a member of the Facebook group. And you can make this a big, exciting thing at church where, you know, you're giving away a hundred dollar gift card to the favorite restaurant in your city that everybody loves. And the only way to be eligible to win is to follow or sorry, join the group and Facebook. Uh, logistic side note number two, uh, I would keep your group as a closed group. You don't need it to be private so that way it can be found, but right. you do want it to keep it closed so random people cannot just join. Uh, let's talk about the most important part, phase two, the content strategy that you actually employ and encouraging people to post themselves. Because the great thing about a group is that ideally, you don't have to be the one that's posting all the time, mm -hmm. that the group populates its own content. So within the Nucleus private group, for instance, we rarely post, maybe once every two weeks when we have a new update or if we have some exciting new features. Most of the time, the group is populating the content all by itself and we have a very vibrant group and if you're a part of that group if you're one of the you know thousand plus churches in there you know that with that being said to start off a group it's often helpful to kind of get the ball rolling get uh, get the ball rolling the snowball rolling to ask questions mm -hmm. so you want to ask fun questions that are easy to answer so you don't want to necessarily start with hey what's a prayer request for this week even though that's a question you want to build up to and it's a great question to ask i wouldn't lead with that just because it's it's a little bit of a heavy question and you might just get unspoken unspoken <laughs> unspoken and then you know that's not really helpful so you want to ask questions that are easy to answer. So, you know, we're recording this and I don't know if it's this week or recently, but it's right around spring break time. So you could ask a question like, hey, what's one activity you and your family are doing this week for spring break? And that's an easy one to answer. Or if there's a fun little competition in your town, like there's two favorite barbecue joints that everybody loves. And it's like, hey, the staff is getting barbecue at Timmy's Barbecue today. Who do you like? What's your favorite barbecue? Timmy's or Tommy's? And then you got a poll, and that's an easy one. And yep. that's some, that's another option when it comes to creating uh, content and having people respond. Because this is kind of the first step to getting people to initiate their own conversations and posting from scratch is getting them to engage with a pre-existing post. This will also help feed the algorithm so that the people that interact with this post are more likely to see future posts. And so you want as many people to interact at the beginning. One thing we do is when someone joins the group, we always encourage them to introduce themselves. Mm -hmm. And that way at the very beginning, they're posting, they're letting us know where they're joining from. And suddenly they've already interacted with the group 
group and they've signaled to the Facebook algorithm, hey, I'm a part of this group, but I'm also an active member. I've already posted yeah. in it once. And you don't even have to have someone to actually post. You can get someone to respond to a poll. That's a real easy one for people that are like, I don't want to comment, but I can respond to a poll. That's pretty much anonymous almost. You know, my, my little avatar will show next to the choice that I made, but that's about it. And so you can do something like that. Like, hey, what's your favorite barbecue joint? And let's say there's like, you know, four that are really popular in your city and you put all four, you know, or hey, what's your favorite fast food place? And everyone chooses Chick-fil-A and that's fun. And You, you know, you can do something like... who. The NCAA March Madness Tournament, you know, it's just just almost finished up, but we were in doing that in March. You could have done something like, hey, who are you picking for your winner this year? Or yeah. who's the your favorite Cinderella story? Is it UMBC? Is it Loyola? Is it, what's another? You're asking me as a final Florida basketball. State. <laughs> uh, those three teams all, you know, had, had a little bit of a run. You know, you could do something fun with that. You want to mix that type of content in with questions like, hey, what was your biggest takeaway from the message this last week? You know, hey, uh, what is a prayer request that we can be praying for you this week? And eventually what happens is you do this enough and suddenly people are asking their own questions and, and it's all mm -hmm. a great time. Final thing when it comes to solicitation and moderation, you do want to have someone that's in charge of that so that when someone crosses the line, you know, not necessarily in a bad way, just like, eh, this isn't the type of content we want in our group necessarily. You can have someone delete the post, follow up with that individual, let them know why you deleted it. I I'm not here to draw a line of what you want to, you know, delete and keep. I don't know if I'd want solici solicitation of businesses in the group that kind of feels icky, but that's just me. Maybe it's not icky at all. So uh, Roxanne's the moderator for a couple of our groups, so... She knows what that's all about. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to add like questions are a great way to get started. And it also helps establish what this group is for, even when, though you're the one asking those questions at the beginning, yeah. because sometimes you get added to groups and you're like, what is this group about? Like, what is this for? Is it only for like you to pass information to me or is it for like I'm supposed to post things? So asking questions helps establish like we can talk about all of these parts of life. Like you just automatically kind of fall in line with what other people are talking about. And then the other thing I would add is like um, I just joined like a health and fitness group and some of the other admins on that page like purposely post things like throughout the week as well instead of it just always being the page. And that also helps it be like, oh, they've posted, I can post that type of stuff too. Like I can post my questions or I can post my workout because I see other people doing that. Great point. I think Ro Roxanne just said it was probably more important than anything I said in my <laughs> whole answer. So listen to her. She's smart. <laughs> All right, moving on. Question two comes from Bryce and he says, so with announcements, if you have five announcements on Sunday morning, do you tell five stories and give five different calls to action? So Bryce is asking this question as a follow-up to the announcement formula that I like to use, which is story plus call to action. So if you are promoting baptisms in your church, maybe I'd tell the story about how when I was a kid, I was baptized in my pastor's backyard pool. We were a really small church, white, you know, 18 people attended White Steeple Church on the side of a hill. And so we didn't have an actual like baptism place within the sanctuary. Right. Uh, and basically just a chapel. So we went to our pastor's backyard. And afterwards, my grandparents took me out to this restaurant called The Whistle Stop Ooh. in my hometown of Beaton. It was our <laughs> one sit down restaurant in our town of 2000. And Fancy. I still <laughs> remember going there because we almost never went out uh, to eat when I was young. So that could be the story that you tell simple personal experience and then you say if you want to sign up for baptisms you know go to mychurch.info or to the lobby you can sign up there and so that's kind of the announcement formula that we teach and recommend to churches of course the natural question is when you extrapolate that with more than like two or three announcements are you up there telling five six seven stories and then giving seven calls to action the second part of that response is very simple you want to have what we call a central hub at your church a single destination for every single next step that's how we built nucleus the software to create a software where you could build this incredibly easily and with powerful integrations and an amazing platform but whatever you use you want to have a single next step a central hub so that every next step is always the same so that you're not saying at the end of the first announcement talk to Pastor Jamie and the second announcement check your bulletin and the third announcement visit the website and the fourth announcement open the church app and the fifth announcement call the church office you're laughing but I've done 30,000 <laughs> church announcements and this is what every single church does yeah we need a new way of doing things the central hub is the way to fix that that's the second part the first part do you need five different stories 
The easy answer to this is you probably shouldn't be doing five different announcements at church. At our church, we do one, two, maximum three each and every week. And so I have no problem telling one, two, or three stories because there are a few announcements and they allow for that. This formula doesn't really work when you're doing five, six, seven announcements, or at least it doesn't work for every announcement in that way. If you're forced to do that many announcements, I would challenge it and say that you don't have to and there are ways to get around that, but that's really for another question. If you feel like you have to do that many announcements, you probably only wanna choose one, two, or three announcements that would have their own story. And that should be pretty easy because if you're having five announcements, it's likely that not all five are equally important, right? Right. Like if you're doing baptism, men's retreat, women's retreat, youth retreat, kids retreat, because you've got a lot of retreats, baptism is probably the one that's most important out of those five because it's the one that applies to the most people, the largest group within your church. And that's an easy way to decide which of these announcements is most important. Just look at how many people the announcement applies to. And then you can actually sort your announcements by importance and then tell a story for the first one, the first two, or the first three only, and then just breeze through the others a lot more quickly, prioritize the ones that matter most. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question comes from Andrew and he says, do you have any tips when it comes to naming a church or business? Like, does your name have to go along with your mission and vision statement? If you are in a very, very churchy area, how can you uniquely name your church so it is distinctive? What's a good process when it comes to coming up with names slash combining words, examples, connexus, story tape? Well, thanks for the question, Andrew. Uh, I think We have three different stories for how we named each of the three parts of our company, uh, Pro Church Tools, Nucleus, and then Story Tape in that order. Let's be honest, Pro Church Tools, pretty terrible name. (laughs) Pretty much means nothing. It was recommended by my best man when I was living out west, still in Bible college. He gave me a list in an email of like six different names he thought was cool. He was kind of encouraging me to start the business. I wouldn't have started it if he hadn't have encouraged me so much. And I was like, all right, Pro Church Tools, the .com is available. Let's go with that. I didn't do any trademark searches. I didn't look for any conflicts. It just was like, just a blog, whatever. <laughs> The name is trash. I remember we did a we did a branding meeting like two uh, two years into running the business, and they were like, "How stuck are you on this pro church tools name? Because it's bad, and it also <laughs> doesn't mean anything." And so, two takeaways from that: one, there's only so much that goes into a name. Meaning that if your brand is good enough, it will transcend the name. The name Pro Church Tools doesn't really hold us back at all. The only thing that's annoying is sometimes people put the word pro and church together and make it one word when it's three separate words. It's pro space, church space, tools. That guy. (laughs) And so the annoying thing is when people put pro church together and make it one word, but that's pretty inconsequential and, and there's not that much that goes into a name. That being said, we were a lot more intentional when it came to naming Nucleus and the story tape. With Nucleus, we did a trademark search, you know, we did the trademark application and what we wanted to do with that platform is because it was software, we wanted to give it a singular name. And when we were naming that, similarly, we sat down with a couple of different people and we had a couple of different names. We had There were three names. And I had found either .io or .church domains for each. And usually because we're an online business, we always check domains first. Yep. And so the three names were Nucleus, Pivot, and Swivel. Oh yeah, I remember that. Right? Yes. So we were in Atlanta in a co-working space with Justin Dean and Van Baird and Tristan Persaud, one of the employees here, and the four of us were at Rome co-working uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, I don't remember the, the neighborhood. Oh, Buckhead, okay. <laughs> that's the one, Buckhead, Atlanta. And so we were discussing these names and Nucleus was the most popular. We bought Nucleus.Church and we went with that. And those three names all did have something to do with the product. You know, Nucleus, the central hub, like yeah. that's synonymous and so that made sense. And that's actually why we went with that because Pivot and Swivel, while they had something to do with the name, weren't nearly as central to the central hub idea. And so that's why we went with Nucleus. We also wanted a singular word because it's software and we wanted to give it like its own, like one word, whereas, you know, Pro Church Tools, it's just so long. And and we had the .church domain. Uh, coincidentally, Nucleus.com is owned by a Canadian company and maybe one day we'll get the .com from them and probably be real expensive and not worth it at the beginning for sure. And so that's how yeah. that name came about. Finally, story tape. Uh, Roxanne, do you want to speak at all to how this name came about? Yeah, basically you had a concept that you wanted to do stock footage. So then you were like, okay, we need something to do with stock footage. Everybody, you have a job. We're going to spend all morning and you all need to come up with 10 ideas of things that stock footage related that could be our name. So we all just like kept throwing out ideas and you would just search to see if they were available. And finally I was like, 
what if we just combine some story tape? And it was available and you bought it, I think is exactly how it happened. Yeah, and I think that speaks to the answer to Andrew's question, which when you're looking to create a name, it is okay to choose a name based on its uniqueness. And Andrew talked about being in a crowded church space, right? And so yeah. I think there's value to choosing a name that is unique. And because to go back to what I said about pro church tools, once your name is chosen, you start to embody that name, your brand is infused into that name, and if your brand is good enough, it will transcend any problems with the name. Mm -hmm. You know, StoryTape has a similar problem with pro church tools. People, for some reason, they wanna put pro and church together, but they wanna put a space <laughs> between story and tape. And so sometimes I see story tape not stylized the way it should be, it should be one word, and I think, oh, that's annoying, but we made up a word, and so if people spell it incorrectly or stylize yeah. it incorrectly, I mean, that's because we made up a word, nucleus, some people have difficulty spelling it. You know, it's like, oh, where? How does that spell? That's an I have a hard word. enough time pronouncing it. Nucleus, apparently. nucleus. <laughs> that's a whole nother story. <laughs> the point being is that all name choices have their difficulties. I would choose something that is unique. If you can get the .dot com, great. And if you can get all the social handles, that's also great. You can mm -hmm. use a tool like Namechecker .dot com to find if what social handles and domains are available. And that's what we did with StoryTip. We had so many different names. I mean, just recently, one of the uh, uh, one of the names that I had. Real, R E E L, because that's like, you know, like a reel where you play yeah. tape. Like, I had the domain real.church and I let that expire a couple of months ago because that was one of the original story tape names. And yeah. we played with the word real, with story, with tape, with footage, with stock, with video. We had so many, like, so, so many words. We, we just had like this giant list of like, video synonyms and we just started putting words together. Like, oh, that dot com's taken. Well, that dot com's taken. Who would have that dot com? <laughs> and eventually we found story tape and we were like, great, that's it. And it, the second we chose that name, I said to myself, that name sounds weird, but it's gonna sound not weird at all in a couple of months. Yeah, exactly. And that's what it is. Story tape feels like such a thing now because we created it and now that brand has embodied the name. And so two things. One, your name doesn't really matter. Two, it does matter and I would Choose your name based on how unique it is and how you can get a great URL, a great social handle. And we've seen churches that do this really well. Belong Church, Elevation Church, Mosaic mm -hmm. Church. These are all brands that when they were chosen might have sounded funny, like when someone was like, Mosaic, and they were like, what yep. the heck, what does that mean? And now we hear that and it means so much to us because their brand has transcended the name and now the brand is dictating what the name means, not vice versa. Yeah. And if you think of it as this continuum, at the very beginning, the name is going to dictate the brand. And you're going to be like, story tape, that's funny. And then eventually, everyone will know what story tape is or what your church is. And then it will flip. And now what your brand is will actually be what is yeah. influencing the name, not the other way around. So I would choose a name that's unique. I love unique church names. Like we, we've got enough United Methodists and First Baptists mm -hmm. and, you know, Life Churches and Hope Churches and... Life Church of Hope and Hope Church of Life. Like, choose something cool. Come up with a new name, you know? Canada De Canada, De Canada Dry Church, you know? I couldn't even say it. Couldn't even say Good it. Good Lord. The Lord yeah. needs to deliver me. I think, like, one way to, like, help with that, too, is kind of like the way we did story tape is, like, we found words that are still connected to the main idea of it. So church is so much more than, like, we have to name it after the cross or name it after like everything that's already been named after. Like there's so much, there's so much in the story of Jesus and in the story of Christianity that you can pull from. And like, it obviously just has so much meaning. So that's where like things like belong and mosaic came from is like, they still apply to the church, still apply to the message that we're trying to portray, but it was just a different angle. We talk about hope, community, and purpose. Those three things have probably been overdone when it comes to church names. How many life church, hope church, and fellowship churches do you know? There's a yeah. ton. Let's start moving beyond that. Belong, mosaic, elevation. Like these are different total things. Go the Conexus or Hillsong model. You know, I would I would suggest trying to find a name that's an actual word first, but that's sometimes very difficult. We couldn't do that with story mm -hmm. tape, so we went the Hillsong Connexus model where we created a word using two existing words. And so you can do that as well. There are so many options, and uh, hopefully some of this answer and our experiences have, have been helpful. Yep. All right, last question comes from Jeff, and he says, our pastor uses fill-in-the-blank sermon notes each week. Does anyone have a solution for doing this on your smart device? Jeff, 
I mean, this is a feature within Nucleus. We call it the notes feature. It allows you to build a sermon outline and then you can add uh, this notes feature where people can add their own notes and follow along. It doesn't uh, support fill in the blanks as of yet, but I would push back on this idea of fill in the blanks just a little bit. I feel like it's a little bit elementary uh, mm-hmm. and, and it, it, it gets asked pretty frequently of us, hey, can you build fill in the blanks into your notes feature? And I always just push back a bit and I say, look, it... it Like all things, if enough users request it, we will respond to our users and build it. But I think having an add notes feature where you can kind of freestyle your own notes on top of kind of, uh, you know, a point or a bullet point within the sermon is so much more powerful than fill in the blanks. Because fill in the blanks to me reminds me of being a student and like being forced to Mm -hmm. uh, listen to a trashy lecture. And Uh, you're not even actually really listening. You're just like, oh, keyword in this sentence. I know that there's going to be a fill in right after that. So you actually are not really paying attention. You're just paying attention to whether or not you can get the answer. How many times do you remember your teacher saying, and that's when, and this is important, you want to fill this one in, (laughs) that's when Louis the 14th came and you're like, okay, Louis XXIV, okay, 24XIV, you know, like, that's not active listening, that's just passive listening and you're just trying to fill in something and it it has too many ties to school in my opinion. I much prefer the freestyle model where you have an outline so someone can read through the outline and follow along that way and then if they feel like something is really impactful, they can write it in. But fill in the blanks, I think it's just a little too, like, it's it, our churches deserve more than that. It's like mm-hmm. if we're listening to a message that's life giving of Jesus, like I don't just want to fill in the blanks. Like this isn't fourth grade. I I'm an adult. Like you know if 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 you're doing this for student ministry, like sure maybe I can understand that. But we're talking Sunday morning and we're talking about like the biggest, most existential, you know, eternal hope, community purpose, bringing heaven to earth. That's what we're talking mm-hmm. about. I mean. This isn't just history where we got to fill in which country was invaded by X country, you know, like I think it can be better than that. And that's why we have not made the fill in the blanks feature as an option yet. We just make it the freestyle. So that way, here's another thing. Fill in the blank assumes that there's only one takeaway from the message. That's what I was going to say is like, you're real. like, if we truly believe that the word of God applies to our life now and it's a living, like we always say it's the living word of God, right? So I'm not necessarily taking away what you want me to take away. Instead, I'm also hearing God speak to me through you in ways that you can't predict or know because you can't know everything about my life or how my mind works, right? So all of my notes are hardly ever actually like what you want me to take away from a sermon. It's always like, oh my gosh, this reminds me of this. Like I need to go home and read this verse later because it means something else. Like, How did we do fill in the blanks during school? We did it for geography, history, when you needed to know facts so that you could then regurgitate those facts on a test. There's a reason I did so well in school, because I have a good memory. (laughs) But, I mean, we know the problems and faults and inferiorities of standardized testing, where you have to just memorize and then like regurgitate and memorize material. It's not really the best way to demonstrate an actual grasp on that knowledge. And so I think applying that model to the church world especially if all we think about is the subject matter. I guess it makes sense when you're talking about facts of history and geography. Does it make sense when we're talking about like Jesus and walking with the Lord? I just don't think it does. And I think it also represents just a disconnect between, you know, it's just not a good way to learn. Mm -hmm. And it's, it assumes that there's one takeaway from every message. And when we're talking about such big matters as we do at church, I think it's naive to assume there's one big takeaway from every message. And that's not to say fill in the blanks are bad at all, but I just don't think that they're the best method, which is again why we haven't added it to Nucleus yet. So it's probably not the answer that you're wanting to hear, Jeff, but uh, hopefully it does give you something to chew on. Yeah. That'll do it for today's episode of Pro Church Daily. If you want your question answered, send it in, hashtag Ask Brady on any of the major social platforms or send in an email directly to hello at prochurchtools.com and we will follow up there. Send in a video. You'll be immediately sent to the top of the queue. Your question will be prioritized. Yeah. Thanks for watching today's episode of the Ask Brady Show. See you in another. Wow.